Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kodrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a green oxidation of cyclohexanol experiment. This is part two, the reaction, isolation, and characterization steps. We'll start the experiment by weighing out 1.50 grams of cyclohexanol. Get a beaker and a 50 milliliter round bottom flask, put them on the balance, and zero the balance. Then I'll pipette in cyclohexanol until I hit the 1.50 mark. You don't have to hit 1.50 grams exactly. If it's a little more or a little less, that's okay. But just make sure that you record the amount that you do add. Now I'll add glacial acetic acid, which is the catalyst in today's experiment. I'm using a syringe and needle here to measure out 0 0.80 milliliters. Then I'll add a small magnetic stir bar. Now I'm clamping the flask above a stir motor and I'll get the stirring going briskly. Bleach is the oxidant in today's experiment. Bleach is an aqueous solution of sodium hypochlorite, NaOCl. It comes in a range of concentrations from 5% by mass up to around 10% by mass. Take a look at the bottle to see what you've got. This particular bottle is 8.25% by mass. I have some bleach in this beaker and I'll be measuring out 24.0 milliliters to add to the reaction solution. Now I'll add the bleach solution to the cyclohexanol. At first, I'm going to be adding it fairly slowly, dropwise here, with vigorous stirring. Since the reaction is biphasic, it occurs in two layers, you should try to spin the reaction as fast as you can. There is a limit to how fast you can stir solutions. You don't want to splash the solution around, and the stir bar and stir motor magnets can sometimes decouple. If the stir bar starts jiggling instead of spinning, you'll know you're going too fast. In that case, slow it down so you get the stir bar stirring again. You'll notice I'm checking the temperature of the solution every so often here. We want to keep the temperature of the reaction below about 50 degrees. The reaction is fairly exothermic, especially in the early stages when you're adding the first few milliliters of bleach. So add that slowly to allow the heat to dissipate. If the reaction gets too hot, the active oxidant, hypochlorous acid, can decompose. When you notice the temperature starting to drop, you can add the bleach more quickly. Here I'm adding pipettefuls at a time, and the temperature isn't really rising. The reaction's going quite slowly now, and it's okay to pour in the rest of the bleach solution. You can see the temperature has remained below 40 degrees the whole time. To make sure that the reaction is complete, I'm going to heat it gently for 20 minutes. I'm going to use hot water out of the tap, which is about 40 to 45 degrees Celsius in temperature. This is a bath of hot tap water, and I'm lowering the reaction into it, and I'll spin it with heating for 20 minutes. Don't use the hot plate to heat this water bath. It's too easy to overshoot the temperature and get the reaction too hot. If the reaction cools off below 40 degrees, get some fresh hot tap water to warm it back up. After 20 minutes, the oxidation of cyclohexanol to cyclohexanone should be complete. Now we need to test to see if there's any leftover hypochlorous acid. These are potassium iodide starch paper test strips. When they touch hypochlorous acid, they turn a black color. I'm going to dip a glass stir bar into the solution and touch it to the test strip to test the solution. The dark color we're observing here indicates that hypochlorous acid is still present, so we'll need to quench that, destroy that reagent before we move on to the distillation. To do this, I'll be adding a saturated solution of sodium bisulfite in water. This is a reducing agent and will react with the extra hypochlorous acid that's present in the solution and destroy it and convert it into harmless sodium chloride. I'm adding 0.5 milliliters of the solution here and then I'll retest with the test strip. From the black color on the test strip, it's clear there's still hypochlorous acid present, so I'll add another 0.5 milliliters of the saturated sodium bisulfite solution and test again. There's no black color here, which means there's no hypochlorous acid present, so we're okay to go on to the next step. In the next step of the workup, we'll be adding 6 molar NaOH, sodium hydroxide. This is a strong base. 
The point of adding the sodium hydroxide is to deprotonate the acetic acid catalyst that we added in the reaction. Acetic acid is volatile and it could co-distill in the next step. Converting it into a salt makes it non-volatile and prevents it from distilling over. We'll use pH paper to test the pH of the solution. We want the solution to be basic so that we can be sure all the acetic acid has been deprotonated. I'm dipping a glass stir rod in the solution and touching it to the paper. The orange color indicates a pH of about 4, which is still acidic. We're going to have to add some more sodium hydroxide and test again. I'll add another 1.5 milliliters of the hydroxide solution, and then test again with pH paper. Now the solution is sufficiently basic, with a pH of about 8 or 9. Now we're ready to go on and isolate the product using steam distillation. Steam distillation was covered extensively in a previous video, so you should definitely check that out if you haven't already. In this video I'm going to go over the major components of the distillation apparatus and just talk about what's different between this apparatus and the previous setup. First of all, it's a steam distillation because there's water and then a volatile water-insoluble organic compound, cyclohexanone. If you look closely, you can see the cyclohexanone floating on top of the water layer. One minor difference between this apparatus and the one in the previous video is I'm using a heating mantle as a heat source rather than a sand bath. This really doesn't make any difference in the course of the distillation. It's just a different kind of heat source. Be sure to use a variable transformer to control the temperature of the heating mantle. Don't plug it directly into the wall current. It will get too hot. The only other difference is I'm using a graduated cylinder as a collection vessel instead of a round bottom flask. But again, this change won't make any difference in the course of the distillation. The flask you distill something out of makes a big difference and it should be about half full. However, the vessel you use to collect the distillate in could be just about anything. It really doesn't matter. Here I'm raising up the heating mantle to make sure it makes good tight contact with the bottom of the flask. I'm turning on the variable transformer and setting it to about 50% power. Now some time has passed and the distillation is heated up and we can see distillates starting to condense in the condenser and roll down into the collection vessel. Here you can see the temperature of the distilling vapor which is just below 100 degrees Celsius. We'll collect about 4 or so milliliters of distillate. That'll give us enough cyclohexanone product to work with. I'm zooming in here so you can see the distillate more clearly. There are two layers. One is the cyclohexanone and the other is the water layer. At this point I'll stop the distillation and move on to the next step. Here I'm weighing out 0.5 grams of sodium chloride. That's table salt. I'm going to add this to the distillate which contains the mixture of water and cyclohexanone. The idea with adding salt is it'll make the water layer salty. That does two things. First of all, the salty water is a lot more dense and it'll help settle the water layer out and away from the cyclohexanone layer. Secondly, it makes the cyclohexanone a lot less soluble in the water, so we're less likely to lose cyclohexanone in the water layer. You don't need to weigh out 0.50 grams of sodium chloride exactly. Just get as close as you can. Here I'm pouring the distillate into a centrifuge tube which has a pointed bottom. We're going to use this point bottom tube like a mini separatory funnel and do very small phase separations. Now I'm adding the sodium chloride salt that I weighed out earlier and I'll agitate the test tube to dissolve as much of the salt as possible. Now I'm adding 4 milliliters of ether to the graduated cylinder that I used as the collection vessel in the distillation step and now I'm adding that to the distillate in the point bottom vessel. I'll cap that vessel and I'll give it a shake. This is doing an extraction. The cyclohexanone is going to migrate into the ether layer. We now have two layers, a salty water layer and an organic layer that contains mostly ether but also cyclohexanone. I'm separating the bottom layer by putting a pipette down to the very bottom of the tip and sucking out that layer. It's always easiest with these point bottom test tube extractions to suck out the bottom layer first even if the top layer is the one you want. You just have so much more control sucking out the bottom layer than you do trying to separate a top layer from a bottom layer. Here I'm sucking out the last few drops of that bottom layer. Now that we have the top and bottom layer separated, we need to determine which one is the organic layer and which is the water layer. I'll test that using a water droplet test. I'm adding droplets of water to the upper layer to see what happens, to see where they go. If you watch carefully, you'll notice the water droplets are sinking through this layer and forming a new layer on the bottom. This indicates that the layer in the pointed test tube must be the organic layer. That's where the cyclohexanone is because it's more soluble in ether than it is in water. Now I'm just removing those few drops of water I just added. 
and I'll pour the organic layer into a clean dry vial. Now I'm pouring the water layer back into the point bottom test tube to extract it one more time. The idea with doing one more extraction is we'll recover the last bits of the cyclohexanone that might be stuck inside that water layer or clinging to the sides of the vessel. I'm measuring out a fresh four milliliter portion of ether and I'll put that back in with the aqueous layer. I'll cap the tube and give it a shake. I'll let the layer separate and then I'll pipette out the bottom layer as I did before and pour the top layer out the top into the vessel that contains the other ether layer. We're combining ether layers here. This is where the cyclohexanone product is. Now we'll dry the organic layer using anhydrous magnesium sulfate. We're going to add enough to make a thin layer on the bottom, maybe two millimeters thick. Add about this much magnesium sulfate and swirl it around. If you can see the powder getting stirred up, you've added enough. If it's all clumpy, you'll need to add some more. Get a clean dry vial, determine its mass, and write this value down in your notebook. We'll use this value to determine the mass of our product by difference once we've evaporated the ether. Now we're going to filter our solution into that vial we just weighed. Here I'm getting a little tuft of cotton, and I'm going to put it into a disposable pipette, packing it lightly into the tip. Then I'll clamp this to a ring stand, and then I'll pipette the solution with magnesium sulfate through this pipette. The cotton will filter out any of the magnesium sulfate that makes it into the pipette, and the solution will come through clear. Now I'm evaporating the ether in a sand bath. Notice how I have a stick inside this vial. The stick provides a surface for the bubbles to form on and helps smooth out the boiling. You'll notice here in a minute when I take the stick out, the boiling seems to stop. I put it back in and the boiling resumes. The stick functions like boiling chips. It's just a whole lot easier to remove a stick in the end than boiling chips. You can also speed up the evaporation by blowing a gentle stream of air into the vessel as it's boiling. Ether evaporates fairly quickly and pretty soon all the ether will be gone and the bubbling will stop. Now I'm weighing the vial that contains the product. I can subtract the mass of the empty vial from before to get the weight of the product by difference. The last things we'll do in this experiment are to characterize the product mixture by IR spectroscopy and gas chromatography. We really hope that the reaction worked and that we converted cyclohexanol into cyclohexanone, but we actually don't know at this point. We're going to use IR to look for the functional group changes, an OH group becoming a carbonyl. That's a big change that we'll be able to notice with the IR spectrometer. Using the IR spectrometer was covered pretty extensively in another video, so you should definitely check that one out if you haven't already, or you're a little fuzzy on how to use the machine. Here I'm painting a little bit of the sample onto an ATR crystal, and I'll put that on the spectrometer and acquire scans. Now I'm starting up the Omnic application on the computer, and I'll hit the Collect Sample button, C-O-L-S-M-P, to get the process started. The experiment collects eight scans and then displays the average results. I'm pressing the Find Peaks button and I'm clicking up higher to see all of the peaks in the functional group region. At this point, you should take a screenshot of your spectrum, save it to a flash drive, and walk it back to your bench. Here's a high resolution spectrum of the reaction product. If you're taking the lab online, take a screenshot of this image to use in your lab assignment. You'll also need to use this reference spectrum of cyclohexanol, the starting material, in your lab report as well. The idea is to compare the two spectra and see what changed. Finally, in this experiment, we'll be analyzing the product mixture by GC, gas chromatography. This is a technique that was described extensively in a previous video as well, so you should check that video out for reference if you haven't seen it or don't remember how to do it. I'm just going to provide the data here, which is a chromatogram of the reaction mixture with peaks labeled with retention time and integration value shown. Notice that there are two peaks, one big one and one small one. I'm also giving you the reference chromatogram of the cyclohexanol standard and the cyclohexanone standard. You'll need these retention times to identify the peaks in the previous chromatogram. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.